We like to start our presentations with an acknowledgement of the lands that we are currently occupying. Um, at NOFAMAS, we aim to make our racial equity statement a living document that drives our work. We heal the harm that racism has caused in the food system. We urge you as a participant to act as an ally to our BIPOC communities as well. Uh, I'm calling in from central Massachusetts, which was once occupied by Nipmuc. And you can find out where you are calling in from and who might have occupied the land that you're using right now um, at native-land.ca. And if you happen to know it, we'd love it if you would introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're calling in from. We have a number of sponsors to thank for supporting our conference this year. Um, if you haven't already, please click through from the program book or a website and check out what they're offering and let them know that you appreciate their support of Nova Mass. So with that, I'm going to introduce Grace. Um, and I should also mention Rafi is here. They're doing the slideshow right now and they're going to help me with um, some links in the chat as well. So thank you, Rafi, for your help. Um, so Grace is the owner of Hops and Lops Farm and an ADGA licensed judge. Grace has taken a dairy goat 4-H project into a nationally competitive herd, owning and managing a herd of about 60 head of her own dairy goats. In addition to having mentored and managed other herds, she has developed a wealth of goat knowledge to share. She's very involved in several clubs and associations, including being president of the Connecticut Dairy Goat Association, secretary of the National Sun and Breeders Association, and a committee chairman for the International Nubian Breeders Association. She is the co-founder of the Utter 4-H Club in Litchfield County, Connecticut, where she's been very involved in teaching local youth about everything goats. So with that, I'll let Grace go ahead and get started. Hi, so I'll hold my thing up really quick. So, um, so again, my name is Grace. I just always try to put pictures up and if I don't put this in, I'll forget about it when I run this presentation in another place. Uh, but we raise Nubians and Sanans um, as well as a couple of matches. Um, so just to show you what kind of um, goats we raise. Uh, we raise primarily for show, but um, I have quite a bit of experience as far as um, performance programs and production and everything. We do a lot of those and genetic typing. So we're pretty familiar with a lot of different areas. Um, in our herd. Um, and as she said, I'm involved with quite a few associations. Uh, before we get too started, I um, figured it'd be easier in the comments and hopefully I can see them come up on here. Um, I just want to hear, you know, are you guys experienced goat owners? Are you new? Um, are we, you know, what, what are you more interested in just to kind of keep everything related to that today? And mine doesn't want to show up, but hopefully we can at least tell me. <laughs> um, do you want me to tell you where I am at in this? That is totally fine, yeah. I am currently living places that I am in places where I can't have goats, but I hope to live somewhere where I can next year. Mm -hmm. I am looking to both raise boer goats for use of transportation, as shown in that picture, and also raise some goats for milk. Yep. Milk. So that would, I, I probably would have to start with a herd of three or four goats. Mm -hmm. goats. I've worked on a farm that has goats, those goats for a while now, and I also... I've done things with Dale to get a little experience with training. Yeah, so we'll, I have, um, I'll spend a little bit more time on it because I'll, I'll kind of broke it down into kind of before you get your goats, everything you need. So I'll spend some time on housing and just kind of what regulations you're looking at as far as, you know, a location available to have goats and where you need to check before you move there just to make sure you have adequate room but I definitely get into that. Just it looks that. like we have a, a couple of people who are new and considering goats. Okay, perfect. So that's where a lot of this is aimed towards. 
So obviously if you're looking into getting goats, um, a big thing is figuring out why, just like you said, um, you know, I think the main one in New England is going to be dairy goats. Obviously people want to have it um, just to make, um, produce their own product. You want milk, um, you can make cheese, fudge, pretty much anything you see in the store in that dairy department, you could pretty much make a lot of that um, at home in some way, um, as well as, you know, um, soaps and lotions and lip balms, um, different products for resale. These are really great for conditions like eczema. Um, you know, goat milk just has so much good and um, just it's easier product for a lot of people, especially with those lactose intolerant are able to um, just digest it just because it has smaller globules than um, cow's milk. That's why a big reason why goats are on the rise is, you know, they have a baby that isn't doing well with formula um, or they can't drink cow's milk. And the answer is get a couple goats to milk in your backyard and to feed them. And then usually it escalates from there. Uh, so obviously through that, any of these really you can show as well, um, which is some of our other interests in the area. Uh, meat goats, obviously, um, we see mainly a boar industry and I'll talk about the breeds a little bit more out here, but a lot of the meat production we see is just small herds. Again, people who want something for themselves or have some extra kids to sell. Uh, fiber, again, it's smaller in the smaller area for goats in the area, but we're starting to see quite an increase in them, um, especially um, down in Southern New England. I've seen quite a few small herds pop up. Uh, working, so just like you said, we have that picture of a cart goat and we don't we see some of it actually more in Vermont area. There's people who do it and they go to different fairs and everything, but they're great to just drive, whether it's for entertainment, um, whether you teach them to pull a cart and just help um, just move wood or anything like that. People have had them starting to pull logs, um, smaller logs. So again, there's a ton of uses here and potential as well as um, cart or pack goats. So go hike, hiking with them. You can buy several different style packs and people are getting into that as rec um, recreational activities. And brush control, um, we were talking about before you guys came in, they're really using goats. The bottom picture I believe is the Reagan Library and um, a few different situations. They've used them to cut down or eat down some of the plants and everything just to help with fire control. Um, people do it as just a more natural option um, just to keep brush down. So there's a reason why goats are really on the rise. I think the last 10, 15 years or so, and you know, they're, they're just a great personality and there's so many different uses for them. Um, so they're definitely becoming popular and obviously show. And then the obvious is also pets or companions. And I'll say we have two pet weathers, which are neutered males in our property here um, that are just pets and hang out and people love that. So breeds, um, as far as dairy, so I'll get into a little bit more with registration later. Um, primarily, um, we're going to use ADGA, which is American Dairy Goat Association, AGS, which is American Goat Society, where there's people breeding mini breeds, um, which are some kind of cross um, trying to get to that standard. They're fairly new between a Nigerian dwarf and all of the other breeds to get those breed standards on a smaller goat. Uh, so that's the miniature dairy goat. Um, I think it's actually association. I meant to change that to an A. Um, so breeds, alpines, and hopefully you can see them well enough. They're the top left. Um, they're going to be one of our larger breeds. They tend to be heavier milk producers, more in quantity rather than um, the butter fat or protein we look at in the milk. And alpines also in the top right corner. Um, La Mancha are the ones with the really tiny ears that everybody's going to ask you um, multiple times if you take them anywhere, if you cut off their ears. We haven't, they're born that way, <laughs> but they're supposed to be a more um, a medium to large breed and they're typically a little bit higher in butter fat. So one of those breeds that tends to be a little better for your dairy or someone um, looking into making cheese. Uh, Nigerian dwarves, which we see all over, are the small um, breed of dairy goats. They only come up a little bit um, around your knee. Um, so obviously a dwarf breed, they're easier for people to have in their backyard. Um, these are really popular in 4-H just because they're small and they're typically easier for people to handle. Um, I will say that, you know, logistically, if you're going to have goats in your backyard, 
um, for milk production and you're gonna hand milk, they're not always the best option just because a much smaller goat can be a little bit trickier to milk. So something as we get into buying goats is just kind of keep in mind there. Um, but they all, they're also um, higher on butter fat as well. Uh, Nubian is the one with the long ears. Um, so they're again, a large breed and they tend to be maybe not as productive as breeds like Alpines or Sonnens we'll get to, but they're higher in butter fat. Um, Oberhasley is the black and tan one in the bottom left. Um, they're a medium breed, tend to be, um, depends on the genetics. They, some will be higher in protein and butter fat, which is good for those cheese producers and trying to do different things with your milk. Um, but again, they're a more moderate size breed. So they're a little bit easier for some to handle. Uh, Sonnens is the totally white one and I'll bring up Sable too, because Sable is essentially just a colored Sonnen, um, but large breed and they tend to be again, like Alpines, heavier milk producers. So good for somebody who might just want one goat to milk um, or is looking at a dairy setup. And Hagenbergs at the end are a little bit of a heavier bone breed, but they're still a little shorter, a little bit easier to handle for some. Um, again, really depends on the genetics. Some of these can be higher in butter fat and that really goes for anything. Again, I try to tell people so you don't get a little gyp that always make sure you're looking at the genetics on these guys, the production, you know, just because somebody says they're milking a gallon a day doesn't mean you're getting enough. You wanna look for those that data and you wanna look for the butter fat, especially if someone is interested in a dairy setup um, or you might want, um, you know, like I said, to make cheese, to make um, butter, different things, you might want those heavier butter fats or proteins in your milk. Um, and then on the side, we have just one of the top does that's ever been bred, that Alpine. Um, the dairy setup is actually at Sweet Pea Cheese in Granby. Um, so they have some cows as well and they mix, they'll mix the milk to make different products, but just a pretty simple setup um, as well as just some soap. Uh, meat breeds. So, while really any breed can be a meat breed, um, you know, you, people make market weathers out of dairy um, breeds a lot of the time, especially Nubians are a good option since they tend to keep a little bit more weight. Um, I just tried to touch on the ones that are a little bit more popular um, in New England and boars are definitely going to be the number one. Um, we see a lot more boar herds out there. Um, you do see a few of the Kiko, the fainter, um, which is also called my tonic. Um, and even a couple of pygmy herds out there. And typically it's just somebody who wants a couple goats in their backyard to have a couple um, feeders. Um, and boars, while they're probably one of the better ones as far as what you're gonna get, um, like meat, just the quantity of meat off of them, they are a little bit bigger. They are a little bit trickier for some people to handle. So those Kikos, the fainters and the pygmies are sometimes easier. And then obviously you can get some dairy weathers as well, um, which a lot of people seem to like, um, especially the Nubians and typically they're gonna be bottle fed. So it's just as far as handling, that can be a little bit easier as well. And fiber. So I've seen a few and they, they've been mixing them a little bit with other breeds, but your major ones that I've seen around here are gonna be your cashmere and Angora. Um, so the Angoras are on the left and the cashmeres are on the right. Um, so they're fairly similar in a lot of ways, um, but the cashmeres are gonna shed out their hair once and hopefully I'm not messing this up because my 4 are gonna be mad at me. Um, but then you're also, you can also shave them once a year. And I believe the angoras you're gonna shave probably about once a year. Um, the biggest difference that I've noticed is the cashmeres tend to be a lot hardier than the angoras. They don't need to be blanketed as much um, as the angoras and um, they're a little bit bigger, just a little bit stockier. Um, but for the most part, you know, the fiber on the Angoras, that mohair is going to be a little bit finer, a little bit silkier. I think it might go for a little bit more money. I'm saying a little lot, my goodness. But um, cashmere, like I said, they're a little bigger. So you're going to get more fiber off of them, just hardier for New England winters. But people definitely, I think when they get one, they sometimes end up getting the other and having a few. So they're definitely um, interchangeable. So, but any questions on breeds before I get too far? <laughs> Just because I know that was a lot to take in. If not, we'll keep going. So things to think about before buying. So this is definitely for those that might not think they have the correct property. Um, 
you know, I think a lot of people see a cute video of goats on the internet and get them and then are completely overwhelmed or not prepared. Um, so first thing, why do you want goats? Um, I'm very big on, you know, I, I know we see a picture of a cute goat on for sale on Facebook, but we don't need to buy it immediately. You want to make sure that's the right thing for you. So I'm big on, you know, having goals for your goats. So are you looking, um, just like um, he was saying before, do you want milk production? Are you looking for something for meat? Um, how big of a production do you want? You know, are you looking to sell to other people um, or are you looking more just for your own personal consumption um, as well as pets or companions as, you know, are you looking for that? Do you wanna, you don't wanna overpay for something. So um, does your town allow goats? So just like he was saying, um, you really wanna pay attention to your zoning laws. Um, so every town is different. So unfortunately it's not something I could give you directly. The best thing I could say is just email or call that town hall and they'll give you the contact. Or if you have the um, contact, that's great just to make sure you're getting the up to date. Um, so obviously, and they're gonna look for, typically the town has a law specifically about whether or not you can have livestock or if you have the right to farm, um, but you also need to see how much property you actually um, are required to have. And some towns are just a half acre, others they want five acres. So, and while goats don't take up a ton of property, you still need to abide by that just so you don't run into any issues. Um, and then yeah. is this gonna be, oh, what was that? There's one question before you move on from breeds. Is this a good time? Yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, just wondering if Boer is the best working breed. By working, I'm gonna ask, do you mean, um, oh, for like carts and everything? I personally, I think any breed is good. Um, boars are a little bit heavier boned, which is probably a good thing, but I see plenty of dairy weathers doing it. So as long, you know, I think Nubian would be another one I'd go to, but it really could be anything just because they're a little bit heavier boned, so they're a little sturdier. Um, but as long as they're being fed well and they're not going to get a little bit of a frail bone, you know, they, they have adequate condition to be working, you shouldn't run into an issue with anybody. So I have people that bought, bought goats for me that are Hardings, even Sonnens, who are a little bit, um, it's really dairiness, but just for more um, general term, they're a little bit of a racier breed just because, you know, they're, they're a hardworking animal for, as far as dairy can, um, goes and they don't carry as much extra condition, but even they still manage it well. That was a lot, so hopefully that answered it. <laughs> um, so, so going back to this really quick, um, you know, is this going to be an issue with your neighbors? And even I'll say we moved to this property. Um, we're in Harwinton, Connecticut, so we're right near Torrington Litchfield, if anyone's familiar. Uh, but we have we have about four and a half acres, but we still have neighbors on every side of us. So while everyone likes it because you know it's nice to see a farm and around, and you know they like to come over and see baby goats, really. But you know you're still gonna have somebody who wants to complain. So you really need to keep in mind, where are you gonna keep a muck pile? Or are you gonna get it taken away? Um, you know, is the smell gonna bother them? When the goats are in heat, if you have does, is that gonna bother them? So when you're setting up where you want your goats and everything, you got really gotta keep that in mind because, you know, an upset neighbor could cause a lot of issues for somebody. Um, so, and then obviously, do you have the funds to build housing and fencing or do you have it? And same goes for, do you have the funds for vet care or anything else like that? Because goats like to injure themselves in ridiculous ways and you know, they, they get into trouble and they, they're, they're like toddlers. So definitely you always gotta have something aside just to make sure. And, and speaking of vets, um, obviously, do you have experience or have you done enough research like coming to this presentation or finding um, mentors that are local, as well as have you found a um, vet that will see goats, because that can be trickier to find um, in some areas. I think New England, especially Southern New England, seems to be really good, and I haven't heard complaints from people up in, you know, New Hampshire and Maine and even New York, so I wouldn't be too concerned in this area, but you want to get that um, set up in advance and make sure you're, you think you have a good vet to work with, because that can be really tricky to find. So also keep in mind, obviously goats are herd animals like we brought up before. Um, so you need a minimum of two 
Um, my, my opinion, if you're getting pets or if you're just getting a few, you're not really gonna be breeding. Try to get three or four just in case something happens. Um, when they get older, you know, they have another companion that's been there for their life. If you're getting animals you plan to breed, and especially if you have a smaller property, um, I typically say get two or three. Um, three is kind of a good insurance just in case something bad happens, you lose one because they do need a buddy and they get very upset if they lose their buddy. Um, but it's you don't want to get overwhelmed because you're going to breed a goat, um, especially dairy, and you're going to want to keep a kid and you know then you want to keep another kid from another doe and it gets overwhelming very quickly. So you just need to make sure you kind of know, you know, you plan ahead a few years. Okay, I need room for this many goats and we want to keep babies out of these ones. So just always keep that in mind because goats are very addicting as people tell you, it's like chicken math. So um, goats cannot eat everything. <laughs> I, there's a lot of people who just want to get goats and throw them into a field and hope it works. And sometimes it does, um, other times it doesn't. Um, you know, you got to check your property because things like mountain laurel, milkweed, um, very common things in this area, they can get very sick from. So you just kind of have to know your property. Um, even like our field, we get some milkweed. So we walk through there usually every day and just pull up any new stuff that comes in there. Um, usually they'll leave things alone, not all the time. Um, and that's why you got to keep a close eye on them if you have a really big um, property with a lot of brush. Um, the other thing to keep in mind there, goats are technically not grazers, they're browsers, so they want to eat things up high. Um, um, you know, they're not like sheep that want to eat the grass. They will. Our, ours tend to graze more when they're in their pen, but they're going to want things up high. They're going to want to chew on tree bark. They're going to want to eat different weeds that grow on the fence. Um, if you have a um, lot of brush that's really high, they're going to go for that. So um, keep that in mind too. There might not be the best lawn mowers, because again, I get a lot of people who want pets that say they want that. <laughs> um, but goats are escape artists. As I said, they're like toddlers. Um, I want to say Nigerian dwarves seem to be big jumpers. And while ours have been pretty good, um, Lamachas tend to be trouble just because they have a lot of personality. Um, but so just you got to make sure everything's really, really sturdy. And I'll get into that later more. Um, obviously goats can be vocal. Think of your neighbors and everything else going on around your house just to really make sure that it's not gonna cause an issue. And goats can live 10 to 15 years, um, typically working animals, bucks, does, um, not as much um, carting or anything, but goats that are being bred are gonna be more in the eight to 12 year range. And then your weathers or your pets are gonna be in the 10 to 15 year range. So just make sure you're ready to handle that for that long of a lifetime. And they must um, be bred to freshen and produce milk and freshen means to kid. So unfortunately you got to also think, you know, I need to find a buck. I'm going to have to bring her to the mail. I'm going to have to deal with kids every so often. And while you don't need to breed them every year to produce, which is why asking about production records is really important. Um, it's, you know, you can breed them every two years. You're still going to end up with triplets or um, twins pretty frequently. So you're going to have to think about, all right, I need to sell this many goats every so often and both emotionally as well as, you know, just the time and finding people to buy the kids. Um, it's just something to think about. So facilities. So getting more into where, and if you have any questions about this, um, I try to put some pictures up, but it's definitely open to conversation because this is, everyone's situation is so different. Um, but outdoor space, as far as fields, um, you know, obviously they like to run, they want to move around. Um, some are a little bit lazier, but they need that space to run around when they want to. Um, usually, I, I say you should really have, give them access to no less than about an acre if you have a, a decent, enough of a herd. Um, goats can live on a much smaller property. Um, you can give them you know, a quarter acre, a half acre, and they'll be fine, but it's better to have a little bit more room just for parasite um, issues. You know, you're not as congested in one area. You know, you're not gonna kill all your grass. So they're gonna be able to eat a little bit more of the actual vegetation and what's out there. Um, and then obviously rotating fields, like I brought up parasites. Um, so 
different times of year, obviously we have more parasite issues and we're lucky in the winter we get a freeze and we tend to kill off a lot of the parasites that we're dealing with outside. But it's still um, in an ideal situation, if you have different fields, you can move them to every so many weeks um, just to kind of let things, first of all, grow back so you're not killing all that vegetation on top of, um, you know, you're letting those parasites kind of die off. So instead of having to use as much, much wormers or treatments, you're able to more naturally get rid of those parasites that um, you have in your area. So housing, um, draft free is the biggest thing. And you have to be able to close it for the winter. I've seen everything from, you know, I had a family who bought two weathers years ago that lived in a calf hut for all of um, their life. They lived on a pallet underneath and they just kept in the night, they just put something over the front of the door and they lived there for a long time, never had an issue. They were really well conditioned, which definitely helps. Um, but everything from that, I've seen some pallet, um, like some wood pallet buildings, which I'm a little cautious with, just unless you're really good and they're sturdy and you're able to um, build things well. I'd be a little concerned about, you know, the weight of snow or goats will headbutt or they'll jump on it that it's going to um, just collapse or break. So just something to keep in mind if you go that route. Um, and then obviously there's different barn setups. Um, we have a barn on our property, but on, you know, people will bring in some of like the carports and they'll put wood on the side. So there's a lot of different options. And where we used to keep our goats off property, we um, just bought sheds and we had a couple sheds as our herd got a little bigger. Um, it was never that big there, but you know, just a 10 by 12 shed and you can even put, I think I'll have pictures in here. You can even split it up and put a separate pen or for your milking supplies or um, just a stanchion for hoof trimming. And if you only have two or three goats, that's definitely an easy way to keep them. Um, so fencing, kind of going back to that outdoor, um, I put pictures, that's actually our outdoor field and I'll have more um, coming up. Um, but and then we also have the indoor where you can kind of see what fencing we use inside. Um, so obviously if you really need a minimum of about four feet, if you have a smaller area um, using, you know, six foot fencing like the wood, or, um, the chain link panels is a really good idea if you can. Um, we keep our bucks in those um, exclusively just because they're very destructive and even them, they, they'll break those. Um, but the does typically do fine in that. They have no issues in the four foot fencing, as long as you don't have jumpers does okay. Um, that's obviously if you have jumpers, that's where electric can help in some cases, but you know, you kind of have to see what bad habits your goats get and deal with it. Cause like I said, they're, they're toddlers and they'll get into everything. So um, make sure your fencing is sturdy. I, I've seen pictures locally and people, you know, we get a lot of bear issues down here and obviously the bears are going after livestock now and, you know, they're getting off their bigger and bigger and I've seen a lot of goat attacks and a couple of them, I've seen things like snow, the orange snow fencing or even just really flimsy metal. You got to remember goats are going to stand on it. They're going to um, headbutt it. They're going to rub their back on it they take a lot of beating. So you really need to make sure you, whatever you have is sturdy. Um, just like you can see in our fence, it's a heavier um, mesh kind of fence, but we also have all the posts and the poles. So it's still reinforced when they beat up on it. Um, and then obviously it needs to be big enough. So a goat hopefully can't get out, but a, credit, a predator also can't get into the fence. Um, so obviously, a lot of things can, if they want to get in there, they're going to, but, you know, keeping that electric on the fence and making sure you're not getting any weak spots in it, they can't get under the fence is really important. Even um, we're pretty fortunate how our property was set up. We kind of have a second line when it comes to the back of the property where they had an old horse run. So we have um, two fences to kind of keep them protected. Um, and then on top of it, if you have predators, definitely think about electric and make sure you put one at the bottom. You wanna put something at the top and just kind of make sure it's not big enough a goat's gonna sneak through it. If you do only use electric, I would use it in addition to other fencing. Um, but the other options is a livestock guardian dog or other livestock production. Um, I've seen people use donkeys. Um, I think llamas are another one, a couple different things. Um, we have livestock guardian dogs and if anyone's interested, I don't think I put it in here specifically, we can get a little bit more into that. 
they're definitely not for everybody, but if you have a good size herd and you have a big enough area, I, th I think they are a really good option. Um, just again, keeping in mind, they're gonna bark and especially if you get great peers, which is a pretty typical breed, um, just keep your neighbors in mind. So housing, um, just obviously the biggest things for dealing as I brought up before, parasite issues, is just keep things clean. Um, as far as the inside, you wanna clean them pretty regularly. And I think I get into it after. Um, we do what's called a pack. So um, we clean out our barn about every six weeks, give or take, depending on the time of year. Um, so then even when you do a pack and you keep that extra bedding on the bottom just for, um, and just manure on the bottom just for that heat, especially in the winter, you still need to put fresh bedding on top just to make sure they're kept clean. Um, you don't want them breathing in just a lot of the urine smell or anything, um, as well as you don't, especially when they're in milk, you don't want to deal with mastitis. So whatever they're laying on needs to be really clean. Um, so, and some people will clean them out daily. Um, just, it depends on the size of your herd and your situation. Um, we truck our manure off the property as well as our, our barn is probably made in the fifties and is not um, accessible to get a tractor in there. So we do it all by hand. So typically we end up just stripping it out once every couple of weeks as long um, as we keep putting bedding on top. Um, as far as bedding, um, shavings and wood pellets typically are a really good base letter, um, layer as far as what you're looking for. Just you need something absorbent. Um, and even, I, kind of, I don't think I brought it up, but we put horse stall mats down at the bottom of our barn. We have dirt underneath. I just, I think it's a little bit easier on their feet um, when I put them in there and they're a little bit more comfortable, but you just need to make sure if you have a cement floor or anything, you're really being good about something absorbent just because it doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, so that's really important. And then uh, I put straw on top, which I just, there is some correlation. There's been some testing and while it's sort of debunked, I'm still one of those people who's really picky about, I don't like having my goats on shavings if I'm not gonna clean it every day. So I put straw on top just to keep them a little bit cleaner. Um, everything kind of falls through to the absorbent bedding and it just keeps them happy and it's nice and soft and I spoil my goats. So. <laughs> a little dramatic about they need that straw on top. So, and then before, I um, kind of should have put this at the bottom. So, but we end up putting, before we put our absorbent layer down the shavings or wood pellets or and wood pellets, um, I'll do diatomaceous earth, which is a, really helps the fly problems. I also like to get fly predators and you have to start these before um, just the fly season starts and fly predators start sending them automatically. and we'll start putting diatomaceous earth down um, once we start seeing fly issues or fly larvae, um, but just put it right on the bottom where it's gonna be wet and they're gonna wanna go to. And barn lime as well helps a little bit with the smell and everything, the ammonia, um, but really it's just keeping them clean is gonna make for healthier goats, both respiratory, mastitis. Um, you're just, the cleaner they are, the easier things are gonna be. And I'll get into a little bit more with feeding, but I do have one of the feeder, couple, two different types of feeders in here, well, three actually. We have our hay racks and just our fencing again. You can kind of see what our barn looks like before we put bedding in. Um, and then I'll talk about feeders a little bit more, but we have a keyhole style feeder as well as another hay feeder because goats, like I said, they're browsers, first of all. So they want to eat things high. But on top of it, they also are very picky. And like I said, they won't eat everything. So you really need to keep the bedding or um, just the hay somewhere high for them. So they are they don't wanna eat it off the ground. They're very picky and there's hay waste and everybody complains about it. Um, but it does again, help with parasites to keep that hay off the ground. It's not near manure. You're not gonna start um, a whole cycle over of any kind of eggs coming out, getting back into their feed and causing more issues. So I use um, just a side L style hay feeder, which, oh, I got it right there, uh, which are in the bottom of ours. And I can't see it under my thing, um, but they're just a blue one that hangs over the fence. You do get quite a bit of hay waste with them. I just kind of see it as extra bedding and it's a little bit less straw I'm gonna have to throw down. Um, the silver one we have is really nice for outdoors if you have a nice open barn layout. Again, it's up high, they're gonna wanna eat it. And there's ones you can get a deeper trough, just, that's just the picture I, um, best picture I found. Um, but just so you're not getting as much hay waste, they can still eat it out of the pan and people put grain in the pan. Um, and then a keyhole feeder, um, again, typically there's 
you can get one with a bottom and actual feeder so it's not sitting on the ground. Um, but this is what you're really going to see in a more commercial setting and some barns like it just because you can feed them in an alley instead of having to go in and put the hay in where they are. So it's just, it's a makes life a lot easier for you um, and you're just able to throw hay in when needed. So, and a few more feeders. Um, so the top is actually fencing. So that's obviously on the left, that's the six foot chain link. Um, I like that for a box, like I said, and this is our old property. So you can see the shed um, and we just kept the fencing all the way around. Uh, the middle top is actually inside one of the old sheds and these are these really heavy um i think they're from like a a plant nursery just great pallets and they made awesome pens we we're able to um, just take them apart and turn it into a whole pen system inside of the shed um, but it's super sturdy and i don't you know the end might have bent a little bit just from wear but this never, we never had an issue with them. So if anyone get their hands on them and wants to do a small setup, those are really, really nice. Um, and then just a close up on the top right of our um, dispensing, you can see the heavier woven um, wire we have on our fence. I will say, I, I would prefer something a little bit smaller when we have kids in those pens, just because I've had only the Lamacha, thankfully, get her head stuck in them. Um, just. Like I said, she's just trouble. Um, so if you can get one that's maybe more of like a two by four size, that's really helpful. But this does work, especially with larger animals. Just be mindful if you have babies, um, keep an eye on them if they're in this kind of fencing. And the bottom is just a few more types of hay feeders, just slightly different styles. Um, so again, it really just depends. Like the one on the bottom right, I can't use unless it has a um, clamp on the back but it's also just, we have cement walls and I just can't use it. And I only choose to feed hay inside just to keep my fields a little bit cleaner. So we don't have any of the ones in the bottom left and middle, but they are really good options. Um, I see a lot of people use them with success. So, and this is just a couple more basic supplies I thought of um, just before you get your first goats, whether they're pets or anything. Um, you know, you still want a stanchion for hoof trimming. I'll have a picture of one later. It just makes life a whole lot easier. Um, just get them trained on it. Um, some people feed even their weathers on them every day. Um, just again, it just saves your back from bending over to trim them on the fence line. Hoof trimmers, um, I'll have a little bit more info on that after, but just get them in advance so you have them and you can start working with them when they're young. Hay racks, obviously you need your feed dishes. Um, I just like a really heavy, rubber um, feed dish like get a tractor supply. I don't love the plastic ones because they break and it's just they can get sharp edges so I try to avoid them. Um, collars and leashes and I should have put more pictures. I'll have some I can point out. Um, I really you got to be really careful with goats because obviously they'll break um, they'll get stuck on stuff and if they're in a collar that's just a buckle style um, they can get stuck and um, unfortunately strangle themselves. So I buy, it's not the best because they do break. I don't like to travel with these um, with younger animals, but just a really thin, it's, it's almost a thin blue plastic chain and there'll be pictures of them somewhere in here. Um, or I just get um, kind of a cheaper dog collar that has like a plastic buckle. So if they get stuck, it's easy enough they could break it. Um, but some people choose not to keep collars on them on the pen um, with the help I have, um, my dad helps me. I need a collar on him just in case something happens because he's not as good as catching them. So that's just why we keep the blue ones on them. And obviously a leash, just a leash train them because it'll save you a lot of um, headaches in the future. Water buckets, obviously. Um, and just going without electrolytes, there's a lot of different kinds you can get anywhere from, you know, 50 pounds for $200 to, you know, three or four dollars for a little bag of them for a small herd. Um, they're good in the, if a goat's down or just sick, they're trying to encourage eating. And when it's really hot, I tend to feed these all the time. Just you want to um, encourage that drinking just so nobody gets dehydrated. And if you have dairy goats, especially you need to keep them drinking. And then fly spray, um, like I said, you just want to keep the flies off them, keep them clean, keep them happy. They'll be healthier that way. So I just, I think I'm still using I just use Bronco from Tractor Supply. I'm sure there's better brands than that. That's just the one I've been using for a long time. Um, so questions before you buy. So this is when you're looking for somebody um, and really even before I start there, 
um, when you're looking for somebody to buy from, I highly recommend going to somebody who's a breeder and whether that's a commercial dairy, I tend to say kind of lean towards in a lot of cases, you know, somebody who's regularly testing their herd, I'll get into disease testing, you know, somebody like our situation or even somebody who has a small backyard herd, just make sure you're getting a healthy animal to start off with um, because some of these diseases can really ruin your property. Um, so I typically say go to a breeder. Um, if you have a closed herd, you just want some pets. Um, there are some rescue situations. You just need to be very careful because like I said, once you have something like Yonis on your property or CL on your property, it is there for 10 or more years and it's, are, it's corrupted and it'll corrupt wood and everything. So you just need to be really aware of what you're looking for. So make sure you're getting a healthy animal, especially if you're gonna show or breed, you wanna make sure all the health testing's done. So, and they're obviously, they're healthy when they leave. Um, but other, um, just starting off with like registration, I brought up different registrations you're looking at. Um, if you're getting anything that's being bred, I highly recommend getting it just so you're not in a mess down the road. Um, when, in case you have a kid that wants to show or you wanna to sell to somebody who wants to show in 4-H, you have that registration. You know, it's a few dollars to register each kid if you have a small herd and it goes a really long way. Um, so when you are buying though, you wanna make sure, especially with ADGA, I think the boars are a little better with more DNA typing options, um, but as far as the dairy, you need to make sure you're, that kid is either already registered and you have the paper in hand or you can make sure somebody can look it up online or they're sending you with a signed and completed application. Make sure everything is filled out. I, I, I wouldn't have an issue um, with somebody, we do all our registrations online, but even if you're not sure and you're in a situation that you're a little concerned about, text a picture to a mentor or somebody and say, is this the paperwork I'm supposed to get? Because if you leave that property without the paperwork, um, a lot of people will disappear and you'll never get it. And now you have this unregistered goat that you know, you're kind of in a jam with because you might not want to breed it at that point. Um, so definitely, if you're starting out, try to go that route, get the paperwork if you can. Um, and then is a herd DNA typed? And this is definitely a bigger issue we're seeing with dairy goats right now, um, as far as there's some parentage issues and you know who's the dad or who's the mom situations that come out later. Um, so it never really hurts, especially if you're breeding them, if you're registering. Um, you know, ask about DNA. And again, if you're ever in a fishy situation, just walk away, save, your, save yourself some money and a headache, go to somebody who's um, more willing to answer questions about things like this. Um, production. So obviously, what, what are your kind of production they're doing is really important because again, when you get to these smaller herds, um, sometimes you're gonna get some, you know, data that isn't accurate and somebody's saying, well, she milks two gallons a day. It's like, yeah, when you add in the foam and like any other like thing you can, you know, it, you really wanna have something to back you up. And the same goes for meat animals. Ask them what kind of growth rate those animals have. Um, you wanna make sure mainly that they're healthy, they're free of parasites when you look at those situations. But if, you know, they have boars that, I saw somebody post, they have boars that are 120 pounds walk away because my Nubian, my 10 month old Nubian kids were 140 pounds. So that's definitely not gonna be a good situation for you to be in. You wanna find something that's growing really well. They have a lot of condition. You're gonna get your money back for that animal or get at least what you invested in. Um, and same with fiber. Um, no, I'm not as familiar, I'll say, but you obviously talk about rating fiber. Um, I know they do it mainly on the cashmere. I think they still do in Angoras. I think a lot more is kind of on show results with these guys. Um, so definitely just, they should be able to answer questions and not give you a blank stare, get you off topic. Be ready to ask questions and expect some kind of answer. Um, just, you know, they should at least be familiar and know what they're, what kind of animal they're raising, even if they're not into like dairy goats, DHI or linear appraisal, they should still be familiar with what quality of animal they have and be willing to find you the right fit. Um, so obviously disease testing. So there's three major diseases in goats and there's a lot of, I'll say there's a lot of varying opinions on some of the testing. 
um, CAE or um, caprine arthritis encephalitis is um, just, it's a, typically a blood, milk, any kind of um, bodily fluid kind of transmission. It does have some horizontal transmission, which means from animal to animal, um, if outside of the body. It doesn't live typically long outside the body, but you, it's just one of those things to avoid. It can, they'll have issues with um, the udder. They can be a little hard. You're gonna lose production. Um, you know, they'll be lame earlier on in life in a lot of those cases. So just something to avoid. Um, CL is something you really got to watch for. I, I notice it a lot more in the meat animals and really some of these, just because if they're terminal, they're not going to test. And if they have it, they're not going to make it into um, being an aged animal like dairy goats. Um, so that's why I think the dairy people are a little bit more careful with testing, um, but definitely ask about CL and CL. Um, is essentially just you're getting abscesses at the points of your lymph nodes, which is typically around the neck. It can be in the top of the udder, um, around the front of the goat, the front leg or shoulder. Um, there's a few different spots or even the back leg, um, but just ask them about it. The thing with CL is there is a vaccine out for it. Um, I personally don't use it. Once you use that, they tend to come up positive on testing. So a lot of people choose not to test regularly. I don't, what I do is I might pull blood on a few specific animals every so often, just random and test to make sure they're all negative. I don't have, if I have ever have an abscess come up, which not CL, but just any kind of concerning abscess, they get in a little infection. I tend to test, um, just test the pus just to make sure. And that's kind of my more regular testing. And if you don't, you know, you can get internal abscesses, which is why you have to be careful and do some kind of regular testing, but it's one of those if they don't typically have issues, they're not as worried. And the same goes for yonis, um, which is a wasting disease. And typically these animals don't live more than a couple years old, um, but just a lot of diarrhea, they get very um, just sick at some point in their life. And this is one, again, that's the testing isn't always accurate. Sometimes they'll come up with a false positive. Um, sometimes um, just animals will be symptomatic and they're not coming up. It's just one of those things we don't see it often, but ask about it. Ask if they've ever had an issue, ask if they're testing. Um, rather ask more, more questions than too few. And G success, um, a little bit of a hot topic and it's more, it's a Nubian issue or a Nubian crosses. And I'm not sure if this, they're really looking into this in boars yet, but it could be coming up in there since we do see some um, boar Nubian crosses, especially in smaller herds. Um, it's just a genetic mutation, it's not a disease. So once you can do genetic testing on them and once it's there, that's what they're gonna have for life. They can't catch it. So, um, but again, it, it's kind of similar, not as much to Yoni's as far as they get sick, but there's just something not right. And these animals that are affected typically don't live past two. Um, they just, they'll kind of get, a, sometimes they'll get weaker. Um, they just don't thrive as well. They're a little bit smaller. Um, so just, again, if you're looking into Nubians, ask about it. Um, they should at least really be testing the sires they're using and using normal animals. Um, but I haven't seen too many, but I have seen some herds come up with affected animals all out of the blue in the Northeast. So definitely ask about what their protocols are. Hey, Grace. Yep. Could you uh, tell us what CL stands for? Oh, caseus um, lipnitis. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. So yeah, CL, it's essentially what it is though, like I said, is, you know, you're getting abscesses at different points in the lip nodes um, is the basic answer to that. Um, but they can have it internally. Typically it's external. Um, it can show up at different points in their life. Um, but just, again, it's one of those things. It's typically mainly transmittable through the pus. So that's why whether the animal has one inside and they could be, I don't think this is as big of a deal if they're shedding it that way, but if they have an abscess, that pus, it's gonna get all over your property. It's gonna get on wood that can live in there for a while. So just something, Yo Yonis and CL, I'll be honest, scare me a lot more than CAE do. Um, in a lot of cases. So definitely ask about all of those. And then, was that a good enough answer? I know. <laughs> yes, thanks. I just wanted to clarify. Yes. But yell at me if I'm missing anything, just going from one thing to another. But anyway, so obviously make sure they're free from defects um, and disqualifications um, when you get them. And even if you're just breeding them for background use, you really just want to be um, careful to stay away from all those kind of issues to save you a headache in the future. 
And what kind of supplements or parasite prevention have the animals you're getting have? Um, I'll get into a little bit more of doe care. Selenium, we're typically deficient of in this area. Copper, we tend to be a little deficient of, um, things like that. Obviously, um, and even parasites, you just wanna make sure if you're getting kids, they've had some sort of coccidia prevention or treatment, um, just because obviously that can be pretty devastating and new owners won't catch it until it's really late and it's already done a lot of damage. So just be careful with that. So just a quick one, um, because I've had some interesting experiences and seen a lot with people traveling when they come to pick up goats, um, not only going to shows, but you know, when you come to buy a goat from me, I, I don't like to see a open crate in the back of your truck when it's, you know, 4th of July weekend or something and it's wicked hot out. Um, so these are just some pictures, obviously our trailer, just more of it, more of the trailers just for a, when you're moving a lot of animals to a show or something, just make sure they're comfortable, but uh, mainly just showing some safer ways, the buck kid in the back of the truck on the left. Um, I don't obviously don't tie them in there. Just make sure they're steady. They're good. Um, and then I, I'm going to be honest, I'd, I'd rather transport them in the car than drive my trailer if I'm getting one goat. So you'll see the La Mancha is actually in the back of my truck because I didn't have an, my SUV at home. And then the Nubian in the bottom right was a doe I drove back from Pennsylvania. So that had come from California. So she just kind of hung out back there and I, I really like that mesh fencing I have in the back, but just some safer ways. <laughs> you don't show up at somebody's house and, you know, you, like I bring up in here, they're a little bit easier to move than other species, but you still need to be careful. Um, you just don't know what the weather is gonna be like. So be really careful putting them in the back of a truck like that if you don't have a cap or something or a popper. So hoof trimming, this is one of those things that's so much easier to show in person. Um, but obviously the different options, the hoof trimmers at the top, that's my choice. I like them or the orange handled ones you'll find online. Um, the, the red ones are ARS trimmers. Um, you can get just a flat edge or a serrated. I like the serrated, but I kind of just get what I can at this point. Um, so utility knife, I've, I've seen them, they work awesome, but I've also seen several friends who have raised goats for 20 years, slice their hand open using them. So I don't recommend it, it's just, you, if, if you get practice and, you know, get a sharp pair of trimmers, you're not going to really need a hoof knife or um, the utility knife. So then a hoof boss is, again, I'm going to be honest, I've had one for the last three or four years and I've never used it. It's just kind of an electric um, trimmer you can use to get the bottom nice and flat. It's um, very similar to a rasp. Um, rasp just electric and I'd rather use a rasp or just my hoof trimmers to trim them. You just got to take practice to do this um, and I'll and then trim every four to six weeks and I'll show you really quick just because I have another one. Um, these are just some diagrams and you'll see in the side profile and some of these the shape on the the last line of the diagram on the left just that really nice correct hoof shape um, versus where they started with a really long toe and everything. Um, it's just really the biggest thing you'll see on this picture is just getting that flat. So you want to trim the edges on the side. They'll get that growth over um, the top. Um, you want to trim the heel. And the photo on the bot in the middle on the bottom was actually a kid I had sold to somebody. And I think this was a year later. They sent me this video. This doe wasn't walking right. And I realized they weren't trimming the heel on this goat. Um, and if you can kind of see, the line is where really that hoof should lay. Um, but if you can kind of see the bottom, that whole bottom of the heel is rolling over when she walks. So first thing is obviously make sure you trim the heel. And second, you'll see on this goat compared to the one on the left, you want to leave a little bit more toe just because when they walk, you really need that nice action. They're going to hit the toe and stop. When you lose that toe, they start rocking more on the heel. So it's really important. You want that bottom of the hoof to be flat um, and don't be afraid to leave a little bit extra toe. Um, on the left is kind of one of my more typical hoof trims. I probably could have left a little bit more toe, but that might've been before a show. Um, but it's, it's hard to do this online without having um, a goat to show you guys. But so obviously the bottom should be flat. Um, you really want to look at that side profile before you put them away. Just make sure they're standing okay on the stanchion. Um, if they're 
a little bit more of a troubled shape to the hoof, I'll take them out and I'll walk them around or have somebody walk them in a circle for me just so I can make sure they're not rolling back or anything. Um, so obviously I'll leave this up for a second if anyone wants to screenshot it. And obviously this will have a recording of this as well. Um, but these, I believe the one on the right is from Caprine Supply. Um, so even if you just look up hoof trimming, you'll find these. And you know, it's just a really good thing to have sitting there and make sure you know what um, you're looking at before. Cause I think we could all use a reminder from time to time on the correct shape. So vaccines, I'm sure just in this clinic, not everybody is gonna be as interested in some of the medications I bring up and vaccines. Um, I'll kind of tell you what I think is really necessary. I don't, um, and CDT, at least for goats, is definitely something I say, I feel like everybody should be doing, especially when you have um, a young herd. So it's for the prevention of enterotoxemia, um, which obviously type C and D, which there are other types. And I know type A has been found in goats, but it's not common. It seems to be in one location and it also has tetanus. Um, Ensero is essentially, they, they get a buildup of that clostridium and it's extremely painful. And they'll typically, you're gonna lose that animal very quickly. So the key to first is vaccinating. Um, and obviously you do the does about four to six weeks before kidding or on the kids, um, they'll receive um, one a couple weeks after. So I, I know a lot of people don't like to, I typically do it when they're born at disbudding. And then I do at least another two doses, four weeks apart after that. Um, typically it's recommended to do their first dose at about four weeks and do another one four weeks later. Um, I've done everything from two to four doses on kids. Um, so just kind of depends on what you think seems to work with your herd. So there are some varying opinions as far as the effectiveness and some different opinions. I've switched from a few different brands. I use Vision, um, which I think you can find on PBS Animal Health, um, but they have different ones. I've seen that work in some larger herds and um, some friends on dairies have used that in the past with success. And I've been much happier than that with brands um, that are coming from like the Colorado Serum Company that you'll get at Tractor Supply or Barback. So that's just my personal opinion on it. But there are some discussions and people using them twice a year. You know, I don't think it's gonna hurt. I just, you know, the more you give it, I think you're gonna lose some of that um, just effectiveness. So I just choose to do it that once a year on my mature animals. Rabies, um, rabies is not a approved um, vaccine in goats. If you do go to shows, especially if there's 4-Hers or anything, some of them require it. Um, you're getting the sheep vaccine, so it doesn't cover you. Like you're, when you think of a rabies vaccine, if somebody, a dog bites somebody, it does not do any of that same um, covering. Do we think it works in goats? Yes, and they just haven't put the money in to prove it yet. So that's the unfortunate part of it. Um, but it is a good idea for some people if you live where you might have more predators, it doesn't hurt to get it. Um, and then just some other vaccines that kind of people like to mess around with more frequently. There's a Pasteurella vaccine, um, obviously just mainly for some specific respiratory issues. JVAC is for E. coli um, and then Lysogen is for staph mastitis. Um, a lot of JVAC and Lysogen are cattle vaccines. So obviously a lot of this is off label for goats. Um, I, I have it and I haven't touched it just because we go off property so much with showing. Um, I'm just very cautious to use them, but there's some people who swear by them. So I figured it'd be a good thing to bring up here in case anyone's having, if you do see more respiratory issues or mastitis, that might be something to consider. Um, so just your basic goat medicine cabinet, um, always check things with your vet before giving anything. Um, these are just some of my more regular go-tos. Um, so things I like, obviously thermometer, the first, when you call that vet, you should have a temperature on that goat and for the first sign of trouble, you're gonna check it. And I usually have a couple, just, I use just the um, like human electric ones. I usually have a few on hand just to make sure they're right. The goat in the picture actually had 107 temperature for a week and a half this year. So we were checking multiple ones because we didn't believe it was correct, but it was. <laughs> so definitely have a few just to make sure it's accurate. Uh, probiotics. I just like um, the Probios cattle paste. You can get it at Tractor Supply or whatever. I've, I've seen that works well on my goats and they like the taste, at least most of them. So 
It's not a cure-all um, for GI upset. If there's diarrhea, you still need to find some kind of cause. Typically, it's going to be something like coccidia, but it's a good thing just to have those probiotics, um, you know, because sometimes they might just get into enough of something that they're a little off, but you still need to find a source, but it does help a GI upset. Vegetable oil, um, if anyone's heard of bloat in goats, um, this is a typical normal bloat. Sometimes they eat something, um, sometimes they eat too much if they get out and, you know, get into their feet overnight or something. Um, obviously you need to see how serious it is, but vegetable oil is a really cheap and easy way to at least start to get some of the gas off and make sure that they're going in a good direction. Um, usually give about a cup to a cup and a half for standard breeds. So cut that down a little for um, Nigerians or dwarf breeds. Um, but you know, you want to give them that and they don't like it. They tolerate it, but they don't like it. Um, just make sure you're letting them swallow. Don't Put it down on the lungs or anything get in their mouth and just kind of tip their mouth and feed it to them so they're swallowing um, but it's just an easy way to help relieve the gas along with massaging the stomach so just one of those very common goat issues you see uh, wound care not everybody likes blue coat for goats i've never had an issue with it it's um, i'll also use iodine sprays just if there's an injury or anything um, just an easy way to keep that a little bit cleaner be complex, just another one of those things that if I have a goat that's off or sick, it helps them feel a little bit better and it's pretty safe to use, use under the discretion of the vet. Uh, Banamine is RX, it's an anti-inflammatory and just helps with pain relief. I use Banamine more than anything else. And you, while you have to have that relationship with your vet to get medications on hand, it's something I feel that's really important that everybody should at least have a dose of it on hand just in case of emergency, you know, at 11 o'clock at night and you're gonna to have to drive to the vet and everything. And it's sometimes a little better to have that there just to give them that dose so they get it faster. And fluids, like they go in the picture, um, I not everybody needs it. Um, I'll go a year without using them. And then all of a sudden, like this past year, I went through more fluids than I have ever, um, just for random little things. And like this goat that had the really high temp, um, you know, it's safe. It's easy to have on hand in case of emergency and kind of one of those odd emergencies. So if you do have that relationship with your vet, it's one thing I like to always have with me. Um, and then again, not everybody's gonna like it. And we do antibiotic treat, we're not an organic herd. Um, I'm a pretty firm believer on having something on hand with this. Um, we actually had a doe a few years ago now that just all of a sudden 10 o'clock at night was shaking and starting to go septic. The only, you know, the vet, I, I have one good vet that I really like at the clinic. Well, now two that we have a new one, but there's one I wasn't thrilled with who was on call. And, you know, she kind of told me, well, use this one kind of an antibiotic. And we did. And I texted my normal vet because he'll always answer. And, you know, he said, let's give her, let's just throw two types of antibiotics at her because this goat was going to be dead within hours. And, you know, it came out the next morning and, you know, walked into the barn and we both, I was like, you're not going to believe what this goat looks like. She was up on the stand. She was fine. Um, her otter was ruined, but she was alive. And, you know, the one thing that saved that goat was having something on hand and it's not everybody's choice and some people don't want to use it, but I think it's really important. And as I had to have a conversation with a forager the other day, if, if your vet isn't giving you some items to have on hand, even like that banamine, you're going to lose goats. So it's really important to have that relationship with the vet that you're able to, you know, talk on the phone and figure out a veterinary management plan um, if it's uh, within your capabilities and know when it's time to bring a goat in. So, but like I said, I've saved lives having some of this stuff on hand. And CD, um, and antitoxin, going back to enterotoxemia, this is miserable to get your hands on. If you can, you get, you get it. Um, this is... If you do have a goat end up with entero, and sometimes you still will, even when they're vaccinated, if you can catch that kid fast enough, we had one this past year. Um, if you notice they're off, they have a blow, get them that antitoxin because that, um, that entero just hits them so fast and it's just excruciatingly painful. If you can get that antitoxin into their system, that's your best choice um, chance at saving them. So worming, trying to move through this so we have time for everything, but uh, so regular testing is going to be, um, I'll, I'll start with this. We do FAMACHA, 
which is, as you can see, you're checking the eyelid compared to a card to see the color. Um, this is a really easy way to see if maybe your goat has a, um, any kind of worm issues. It's not 100%, and I see it constantly, everyone, did you FAMACHA, did you FAMACHA? It's not, a, it doesn't show you every kind of parasite issue. It might be an easy answer if you have a goat that's sick and you're not sure, but you really still need to be regularly um, testing for fecals and whether that's sending it to a vet, a lab, um, some people do it themselves. I don't because I don't trust myself to miss something, um, but definitely peak worm season is gonna be after they freshen or even just in the spring for all goats, pets, anything. It doesn't hurt to get a sample and send it off. I typically send one during kidding season as well, so I can worm them right, around, right after they kid because that 10 days after they kid is when they're gonna be the most um, susceptible to parasites. And I also do it right um, when we get home for the year and we're done showing. So I have an idea of any other bugs we might've picked up. Plus then I can treat them right when it starts freezing. So they should be clean for the winter. Um, and obviously mud, anything dirty, and we can't help it in New England. It's, you're, you're gonna have an issue with parasites typically. So obviously keep things clean, as I've said a billion times before. Um, there are some genetic factors. I get a lot of people who want backyard animals that ask about, you know, are you breeding for um, animals that are a little bit more resistant? Well, that's not something I breed for. I hardly have to worm my animals. We just, you know, we get one very minimal parasite that I noticed and it just likes the mud in our area and that's it. We, we don't see a lot of issues. So it's definitely something to keep in the back of your mind. Once sort of people were asking me, I kind of went, oh, I guess my animals are more resistant without really thinking about it that way. So obviously treat as needed and not as a prevention. Just because your goat looks a little wormy, just because you go give it safeguards does not mean you're getting the correct parasite. Not every parasite treats all the worms that a goat may have or every wormer treats every parasite a goat may have. Um, so you really just need to make sure you're testing because you know exactly what you're dealing with. You can treat specifically for that parasite and it's really important. Um, and currently the other thing they're doing, um, I think the most recent update is they're recommending you worm with two different wormers um, at a time and just hit them really hard. It used to be you're supposed to, I think, double or triple the dosage, but the most recent recommendation is two wormers um, just to be most effective. So doe care, um, we have a very pregnant doe. I'm just trying to touch on all of that and then a very grumpy one at the top because um, they typically are. Um, so grain, I like the 16 to 18 percent protein. Um, we feed Blue Seal Caprine Challenger. Um, I actually feed the old one. I do not. They're going to kill me. I don't like the Home Fresh. Um, I I don't feel there's not enough research to tell me that um, a doe needs ammonium chloride in their feed. Um, so I have special requests, and a lot of us in the area feed the old Caprine Challenger, which doesn't have the ammonium chloride. Um, it doesn't have the new probiotics, which I don't feel my goats really, first of all, they don't really need, and the less smells and things in their feed, the less things for them to get picky about. So I don't really have issues with does being picky, and I like to keep it that way. Um, but obviously, does that are in milk, does that have kitted, you know, you need to keep in mind they need that feed to maintain themselves, to recover from kidding, to maintain the weight, especially in your does producing a lot of milk. Um, and obviously to prepare for breeding season. So especially if you're gonna flush does, um, which means just to increase the grain before breeding season to increase some chances of multiples. So hay, um, any goat, and I'll get into bucks and weathers in a minute, but good quality hay is vital. Um, again, in New England, we don't have the best options. We actually get hay that's shipped in from New York and occasionally a little bit farther out west. Um, from our supplier, but just find a good supplier and go with it because it's really tricky to do right now. Um, but typically with your dairy animals, you want second cut. Um, same, I think really for your meat animals, just to get that higher protein, anything to get them more well conditioned, looking at second cut alfalfa for those um, meat and market animals. And then fiber, um, I, from my understanding, I think they do better on the second cut but I don't know if they're as picky as we are, especially um, with the animals that aren't being bred. Um, water, obviously they need to be cleaned regularly. Goats are very picky. 
and if one thing touches their bucket, they, they won't drink out of it. So clean them regularly. We dump them twice a day um, and refill them, and then we scrub them every so often. And supplements. So I like to give um, in our area, and definitely talk to your vet, research your specific location. I like to give selenium. Um, typically, I give it in the form of BOC, which is on there, which is selenium and vitamin E. Um, I do this. And you have to be very careful because it can be tied to issues with um, dose aborting. I do give it before kidding um, about four to six weeks prior to. And then, and I don't give them a huge dose. And then I typically do a smaller one a few weeks after kidding. And then I do one before breeding season. And again, four to six weeks before breeding because that selenium can um, cause them to be a little bit sterile, both them and bucks before breeding season. So you need to well in advance kind of plan out how you're going to do that. Um, an ADE, um, something that's a little bit new to me, just it's really that vitamin A that's I'm looking at. I've seen a few issues where does are a little bit more, have more of a tendency to bow. I've seen it more in Lamaches than anything and ADE has definitely helped that and you can get it in a paste form. And same with selenium, you can find that in a paste if you're not as interested in um, injections. I've just seen the BOCE is a little bit more effective. Um, so obviously, preparing for breeding season for those of you who might be. Um, and I didn't put in here, but getting a buck rag, like you can see these two are all over my glove that smelled like a buck. If you're going off site to breed a goat, that is the most helpful thing you will ever get is getting just a rag that's literally been rubbed all over the buck so it smelled like him and just help detect heat. And these two were actually red, but it, it worked for the presentation. <laughs> um, but flushing, so like I said, flushing is just to increase your chance of multiples. Um, you just increase the grain about two weeks prior to breeding and maintain for about four weeks after. Um, and especially with Nigerians though, you really, unless you know your animals and your genetics, um, you're, we're seeing so many big multiples with Nigerians. I, even in the standard breeds, we're starting to see five or six. Um, sometimes it's best to avoid it until you're a little bit more experienced. Uh, but then drying off, uh, just obviously that means to stop production of milk, both with dairy and meat. Um, it helps to cut back on grain. Just everything milk production is supply and demand. So the less grain, the less um, they're eating, their body's gonna start to shut that down a little bit. Um, and then a dry treatment, again, not for everybody. Um, typically, you know, these are gonna be an intramammary antibiotic. I've seen a huge improvement in outer health since I've started doing this. Um, in, no matter how clean you keep it, some does just are more prone to a little bit of mastitis when they're dry, um, or just, again, we're in New England, it's muddy. Um, if they get dried off earlier, it helps keep that a little bit healthier. Um, supplements, like I said, four to six weeks before, don't give it too close. Um, and typically, I'm just going to do um, selenium at that point. I'm not going to do copper or anything. So buck care, and this really goes for weathers too. There's a lot of varying discussion on feeding bucks and weathers. I'm going to say from my experience and the vets I've worked with, um, it's not the grain that's causing the blockages. And what I'm talking about is urinary calculi, which essentially is, if you think of kidney stones, it's just blocking that urinary tract. And it's extremely painful. It's very dangerous, if, especially if it's not caught in time. Um, but there's a lot of different factors in it. And a lot of people are very driven that it's all grain. It's not all grain. Um, there's, they need to be hydrated. They need to be drinking to help keep everything flushed. Um, you need to feed the correct type of grain. Um, so this is where we get into talking about ammonium chloride, which while you don't really want to feed it to the does, this is what you want for your bucks and weathers. Um, I feed a grain that has it in there. So I don't supplement as much as many. Um, I really want to get that own, their own resistance and breed animals that genetically just don't have these issues. Um, so we do supplement on occasion. Typically you can put ammonium chloride powder and a friend who's a vet told me she does it in jello shots, which seems like a really easy way to give it to them because anyone who's tried to give, you know, copper outside of the capsule or anything knows how miserable that can be. So, um, but obviously just a few days a month, you want to do it. You don't want to do it every single day. You're overloading them a little bit. And again, I think you're really decreasing the, um, you're potentially decreasing that effectiveness. And a two to one ratio of calcium to phosphorus is good to look for in those buck feeds. Um, as well as, I'll, I'll give a warning I've seen a lot of people run into is um, 
you know, there's been issues with, there's a lot of feeds out there. And I think um, there's one at Blue Seal and I can't, or um, Tractor Spine, I cannot remember what it was called, but, um, you know, feeds that are being labeled as dough, buck and weather safe. Um, you really want to look for a grain that is in a sweet feed. I think that does help a little bit more my preference and experience. Um, then you don't really want to give the bucks the sweet feed if you, you can avoid it or the weathers. Just find a nice pellet that has the, you know, has that two to one ratio, has ammonium chloride. Um, Blue Seal has some good options that I've sworn I've fed for years and I swear by it with my bucks. Um, so the meat go and grow. I like the, there's a few different medications in it, which I know not everybody likes, but it, it's great for coccidia and kids and helps them grow a little bit better as well as, you know, you ha still have the ammonium chloride in it for your bucks. So, but I'm sure there's other options that are similar. That's but the meat go and um, meat go grow um, is a really good option to look at the label and compare to other brands you might want to see or um, are interested in just to kind of see what where everything lines up. Obviously, hay. Um, I tend to avoid alfalfa with my bucks. I know some people like it, um, but anything like a second cut, um, I would try to avoid a first cut. Just especially the quality, like I said, of our hay in the area. Just give them the second cut. I think it's just they handle it a little bit better. It keeps a little bit better condition on them for breeding season. And obviously water. Um, and when you see a lot of these people post about when their goats are blocking, nine out of 10 times, it's gonna be in the winter because their buckets are freezing and those bucks aren't drinking water. Um, so use a heated bucket, make sure it's not frozen. Um, you know, I think that's really the biggest part to you know, avoiding you see with bucks or weathers is making sure they have a good water intake. So make sure those buckets are clean as well. So obviously before rut, which is breeding season, um, you want to increase the hay and grain to get some weight on them. They, bucks are just idiots during breeding season. There's no other way to put it. Um, they don't eat, they just want to sit on the fence, they want to fight, they want to yell to the does. Um, so getting the condition on them starting in the spring into summer and even our bucks started going into rut in May of last year, which was ridiculous. So keeping the weight on them is going to be the best way to keep them healthy through breeding season, especially if they're going to be breeding a lot of does. Um, you've got to keep them healthy. So six to eight weeks, I try to be a little bit farther ahead with my bucks. Um, I give them their BOC and other supplements just because they're not going to have it now until potentially February. So you do it. I start breeding in August, so I'll do that, you know, closer to May. Um, and then obviously you want, don't want to decrease the fertility and just be extremely cautious during bucks um, in breeding season. Do not get bucks as pets, make sure they're weathers. Um, do not wait too long to weather them because um, they, they get these buck attitudes. You know, they don't, there are some aggressive bucks and I think sometimes you got to remember because um, also I'm a very, you know, I'm 5'2 and you know, when you have a 300 or more pound buck, you got to make sure they respect you. You don't want to deal with an aggressive buck. Um, just be really cautious working with them because you really, you never know when somebody is going to get aggressive because they see a doe or, you know, another buck looks at them the wrong way and they go to hit them and hit you. So just be very, very cautious. So milking, um, again, it's one I would love to have in person so I could have a goat. Um, but just some basic supplies. If you're going to be breeding, you want to get a goat, um, um, dairy goat. Obviously a stainless steel bucket, um, a strip cup, which is just a cup with a filter. And some people even just use little milk filters um, just to make sure you wanna do that before you milk each dough, just to make sure there's no um, mastitis. You don't see any pink milk. Um, you don't have any little, you'll almost see like little blood vessels in it on occasion. And sometimes when they freshen, that's normal. Other times you just wanna make sure um, there's no mastitis starting later into their lactation. Uh, Pre-dip and wipes, just make sure they're clean beforehand. I prefer an iodine pre-dip, which are getting increasingly hard to find. Um, so I've been slowly investigating other options, but you just want to clean them before you milk. Um, a post-dip for afterwards, it takes, um, what is it, like 20 or 30 minutes for that actual orifice where you, the milk comes out to close up. So a post-dip or fight back, um, either one. I Again, I like an iodine post dip. I think that works a little bit better from what I've noticed, but just helps keep that, close it up a little bit faster and protect it until it's actually closed up. And a hobble, um, just again, if their goats are really bad behaved or if you're new and 
it's a first freshener, it's going to save you a lot of hassle. Um, just It just goes around both back legs so they can't kick you and kick the bucket. So it just gives you a little bit of time to learn while they're um, a little tied up and distracted. So, and this is the stanchion we talk about. Um, Sidel is where I get mine. I, they're a little bit more expensive than some, but they last a long time. You can also make them. We, we made our first one out of wood for like maybe 20 bucks and then got removable legs on it. So there's a lot of options online to look into these and to make one for yourself, but it's good just to help with hook trimming, even if they're just pets. If you want to shave them at some point, it's a very helpful. So um, in any kind of medical, if you have to draw blood, if you, you have the vet and they're sick, it, they come in to help a lot. I use them. Obviously, all the pictures where they've come up, they're disgusting because they're used so much. <laughs> so um, I, don't think, I don't think we have time. I do have a kidding one, but I don't want to get into it if we don't have a lot of experienced people. But if you have any more questions. <laughs> Or anything I didn't get to, feel free to ask. Uh, Grace, there's one question in the chat asking about how much the vet care per goat might cost. It all depends on the vet. Um, typically, I will say, obviously, if you have a farm call, which not everybody will, some people will bring them to the office. If you can, that range is anywhere from, I want to say, $75 to $200. Um, our vet isn't terribly local. I think we pay $175 and if you do that and you have a herd, get as much done in the day as you can. Um, other than that, every vet's a little different. Um, just budding, obviously with kids and everything is one of the big things. And they range from anywhere from $50 to 150. Do not pay $150 for that. Um, you know, health papers, you'll see people ranging from 50 to, you know, even 150 per paper. Um, so things like that are ones maybe to ask when you're looking around and figure out where on that scale they fall into. Health checks are the same way, probably, you know, if, I want to say more like, like 40 to $100, um, roughly. So typically, unless you're breeding or anything, you're not going to see the vet too much with a herd our size, like knock on wood. I haven't seen my vet in several months. When you have that relationship, I can just text them if I have a question or issue and we'll figure it out that way. Um, but, you know, typically with a large herd like we have, they're out here 10 or so times a year. In a small herd where you just have a couple goats, they could be out there once or twice just to do like their rabies or their vaccinations. And like CDT, you can do yourself. A lot of this you can do yourself. But if you do rabies or just don't feel comfortable, you know, you might only need to see them once or twice a year. So it's not cheap depending on the vet, but you know, as long as you have that relationship, you manage the healthier, you know, the cleaner and the healthier they are, the less you're gonna have to deal with it. So hopefully that answered some of that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions, but uh, the last one in the chat was, how did you get your farm name? Um, I was eight. So I don't think I mentioned, we actually, when we started the herd um, or like the project, it was actually a rabbit and KB 4 each project. This all started because we bought a $5 guinea pig at, if anyone knows it, Bethlehem Fair in Connecticut. And the person I bought it from was a 4-H leader. So then it kind of escalated from there and I got involved with other projects, um, dairy cows and then um, goats. So it's, originally was the rabbits and I don't even know where I came up with it. I can remember the day I thought of it and I can't think of where it actually came from, but it was really just for rabbits, but it kind of worked because we started with Nubians, which are the floppy eared goats. So the last okay. thing worked and goats hop a lot. So <laughs> Very nice. Are there any other questions from folks? And if you have any questions, like I said, my email's there. Um, my website has my contact info as well. So I, I know I always think of things after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for providing the extra resource and offer for people to reach out. Rafi did put uh, the link to your website and your social media and your email in the chat so people can uh, grab that. You can also save the chat by pressing the three little dots next to um, the message area in the chat and, and save it to your computer so you can look back on the internet. Uh -oh. What about work goats? What about work goats? What, what specifically? Oh, um, so 
When you're looking, I'm looking to buy two of each, two work goats, two dairy goats. Dairy goats. Um, do you recommend I actually go to a farm that does work goats or to get the kids that I'm going to train? Or do you recommend I, I get full blood boa kids? It, and do they actually, how much more weight can the boas pull over the other ones? So I don't think you'll find too many specific work goat. Like I've seen a couple of people that they don't have a huge farm and I don't think they're breeding, but they train them. Um, and I know, I, I gotta think of the name of it, but they're in Vermont. If you, Even if you look it up, they're pretty obvious. They have white goats in this crazy, part and everything and this like beautiful harnesses um but people like that my recommendation would i would email different people online there's different blogs um there's a couple facebook groups for work goats and cat whether it's pack or cart um i would talk to them first as far as where to find them um you know i would probably find something that's a bottle raised kid versus a dam raised one which makes me want to say I would lean towards a dairy goat. And even if that's just a Nubian, um, just because they're going to be a little bit easier to work with, they're going to bond with you more. Um, and, you know, dam raised kids can be friendly, but there's definitely a difference. As far as I've noticed, the bottle raised kids are a little bit easier to train, even just on the stanchion to collar train and all of that's going to correlate into a working animal. So um, as far as weight though, if you got two Nubian weathers, I don't think there would be a huge difference in what they could pull. Um, maybe a boar kid might grow a little faster. So maybe they could pull more when they're, you know, a year or two old, you know, when they're training. But I think in the long run, you know, as long um, as they're a really, as I said, like a heavy boned animal, um, you know, I, I have a doe in mind. I'm trying to think about a picture of her on here. But somebody who even has a doe who might carry a lot of extra weight, a really big Nubian doe would be something to look at getting a kid out of, um, you know, and just tell them that's my intention. This is what I'm looking for. And they should be able to, you know, point you in the direction because, you know, I have, I know I have a big enough fur, but I know there's does. as I would say their kids probably aren't an ideal choice if you really want to work and pull with them. But I have, um, you know, a few in mind that Definitely, they're just really big, wide animals, you know, built similar to a boar in a lot of ways, not exactly, but, you know, they should still have the same work ability as a boar would. Okay, and how much wood do you think pull? Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my hand. I've seen people, you know, I'm going to say a couple hundred pounds, and I would, depending on the size of them, if you're pulling a team, um, I want to say I've seen people max at about 300 maybe a little more depending on them you know just obviously when they're mature and they're older um per so go, per go that, or total what was that one more time per go or total um i would say total if you have two obviously i probably wouldn't double it but i'd say you know you could get a two-person cart you know two people grown adults on a cart i'd say you know you'd get closer to 400 or 500 with two it really just depends on the specific goat and obviously when their babies go a little bit you know people just have the cart and you just get them used to that weight and then slowly build up from there um, but when you get a couple goats together you can do a little bit more but like i said you know some people my version of a really well a big conditioned animal is not going to be what somebody else is picturing so it all depends specifically on them and kind of you got to see what they do. You got to go slowly and practice, um, you know, just build up to a weight and see what they're comfortable with and that they're not working too hard with it. Okay. So thank you again so much. And uh, hopefully you'll visit us again sometime soon, Grace. Thank you guys for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>